Before we knew him as the guy who doesn't understand how to make whodunit without magically pulling evidence out of his ass, and before we knew him as the guy who took all of the character, soul and potential of the Star Wars universe and flushed it out the window for a bunch of characters and themes that don't even work in his story, never mind the rest of the films, I think most people knew Ryan Johnson as the guy who directed some really good Breaking Bad episodes and Looper. Now I haven't watched Looper for quite some time, but I remember that when I did watch it ages ago that I enjoyed the story, I liked the characters, and overall I thought the idea idea that the film was trying to do was really good. Unfortunately for past me, current me now has to look at it after nearly 10 years and I can honestly say that this might be one of the worst, nonsensical time travel stories I've ever witnessed. You know how you can usually tell that a time travel story was bad because they'll introduce a moment or a storyline that completely contradicts what the movie established or the rules of time travel in this universe? Now throughout this video I want you to keep track of how many different events and storylines occur that contradict the rules established at the start of the movie. Then I want you to remember that apparently Ryan Johnson worked on this script for several years and went through dozens of different drafts to streamline it so the story makes sense. And he still fucking failed. So, to sum up the world building of this film, in the future there are three major things that completely change the world. The first thing is that humanity will evolve to have telekinetic powers at some point, and while most people only have mild powers that aren't very intimidating, some people are stronger than others. The second thing is that time travel will be invented, and although the time travel technology is outlawed by the government, it is still used illegally. The third thing is that in the future the government has developed anti-crime technology so advanced they can alert the cops that someone is being killed and tell them who killed them. Because of this, crime syndicates in the future are struggling to rule their criminal empires because they can't kill anyone without alerting the cops. And so we reach the main premise of the movie. The syndicates need a way to remove competition, and time travel exists. So why don't they just send someone into the past and have them killed and disposed there? That way the cops can't really track them down for killing anyone and they can eliminate the competition and tie up loose ends. Hence the looper system. A member of the syndicate goes back in time and recruits several individuals to act as hitmen called loopers. The syndicate in the future will send targets into the past with a silver bar on them. The loopers then kill the target, take the bar as payment and dispose of the body. When they kill a target that has a gold bar, that target is their future selves, as a way of destroying evidence and to inform the looper that their services are no longer needed, with the knowledge that at some point in the future they themselves will be sent back in time to be killed. So overall, a very unique premise. And according to Ryan Johnson, we don't really need to worry about the time travel in this movie, because according to him, it's mostly just used to get the plot going and then it's discarded for the rest of the story. That's good. I'm glad that the time travel isn't completely broken and won't be messing up the entire plot towards the end. The film starts in the year 2044 in Kansas, where Joe explains the nature of the loopers and shows what they do, explaining that they'll eventually have to kill their future selves and close their loop, as well as explaining that in the 2030s 10% of the human population started to gain telekinetic powers, which they call TK. And already I have a problem with this. It's described as a mutation, but anyone with a basic understanding of evolution understands that human beings don't just evolve that quickly. It can take hundreds, even thousands of years for cells to evolve. So I really think this needed to be explained more besides just telling the audience, one day it just happened. We then get a montage of Joe closing loops and saving up his silver bars, before being interrupted by his friend Seth. Seth explains that his older self was sent back to the past and he was unable to kill him, as he recognised who he was because he was singing a song. And so he failed to close his loop, and he was also warned about an individual known as the Rainmaker who will wipe out the syndicates in the future, before Gatmen arrive at Joe's house trying to find Seth. Now I've got some questions here because the movie doesn't really seem to answer them. Firstly, why bother closing the loops? Joe says it's to cover up any evidence that the loopers had killed people for them in the past so they can't be used against the crime syndicates in the future. But how would they even be linked to anything in the first place? The loopers don't know who they've killed, there isn't any bodies left to tie them to the murders, and by the looks of things when people time travel they can land in a completely different country or continent from where they travelled from in the future. So how would anyone even begin to start searching for evidence? The second thing is that yeah, here Seth messes up and fails to return his weapon and say that he did the job. So obviously Abe and his gap men are going to be hunting him down because they know that something's going on. But in general, how would anyone know that he didn't close his loop? We see that all the loopers are basically given free reign to get on with the job and they aren't under constant supervision. So how would the bosses know that a loop didn't close? If Seth had fired his gun into the ground, 
taken the gold bars, told the bosses he had closed his loop, and older Seth just ran off and disappeared off the grid for the rest of his life, how does anyone from the future know he's still alive? It's happened enough times that there's a designated term for this course of action, known as letting your loop run. So clearly there's been a few instances of this happening before, but unless each and every one of them had the exact same emotional response that Seth did, I struggle to understand how the future version is detected to still be alive. Joe is taken to Abe, who explains that he needs to tell them where Seth is, and while Joe tries not to give in, he does so after they threaten to remove half of his silver bars that he'd been stocking up on. And this is when we get to the first problematic piece of time travel in this movie. As older Seth is trying to escape, he sees that an address is carved into his arm, as his younger self is being tortured. He desperately tries to reach the location as more and more pieces disappear, until he finally reaches the location and is executed. Alright, so from a continuity point of view, this absolutely makes no fucking sense whatsoever. This is not like in the Terminator series, where the timeline that you are part of is irrelevant in the past, allowing you to change stuff and be fine because you are not linked to the causality of the universe and its time stream. This is more back to the future time travel. Except unlike Back to the Future, there isn't a small window of time for you to fix stuff before it catches up to you. In Looper, you are explicitly still part of the timeline and are affected by causality. If you went back into the past and changed things so that your pinky finger was chopped off your left hand, it will affect you even if you had a pinky finger before you time travelled. Which makes everything that happens here completely stupid. Abe even says to Joe that they won't kill young Seth because doing something like that could mess up the time stream. But he thinks this is better? All you had to do was write the address on his arm and maybe take a finger or two. How is this not going to drastically change things for the future? What if he was a major part of people's lives? What if he had a major influence on a community? Or became an important political figure? Hell, what if he still chose to work with the Syndicate and prosper in their organisation? All of this literally cannot happen because he's now a stump that will need care for the rest of his life. It's also a paradox that absolutely breaks time. It's literally the physical embodiment of the grandfather paradox played straight with no negative repercussions whatsoever. Let's say that the Syndicate looked after Seth after they mutilated him, and kept him alive for 30 years so they could send him into the past. Older Seth obviously wouldn't be able to sing or run away if he was like this, would he? But if he couldn't do that and younger Seth shot him immediately, then he wouldn't have been mutilated in the first place, which means that when younger Seth got older and got sent back in time, he would be able to sing, and that would stop him from being killed, leading to him running away and getting his younger self mutilated. You see the problem here? The massive, very obvious problem that the story proceeds to just ignore? Is this the time travel that you told us is simple to understand and doesn't require much thinking, Ryan? And in general, this plan to kill older Seth is just fucking stupid. You have no idea where he is, but you're only giving him 15 minutes to get to the address you're at? And on top of that, you start removing his limbs? You know, the main things that allow us to get to places? What if you did something that led to his death here, by not being able to control the car? Would you just keep torturing Seth forever? So, after talking to his girlfriend and feeling guilty about what happened, Joe wakes up the next day and goes to do his loop. However, when he arrives, not only is the target late and not tied up, but he realises very quickly that this is his future self, who proceeds to knock him out. When Joe wakes up, he quickly rushes back to his apartment, only to see that Gap men are there and a fight soon breaks out, with Joe falling from the fire escape and getting knocked out. We then see the timeline of the older Joe, who ended up in Shanghai and after another two decades of crime and drugs, found someone who changed him, marrying her and settling down. When talking to his younger self at a diner, Joe explains that when it was time for him to be sent back, the criminals killed his wife, something that he wants to prevent. Ryan. You established three things, that humanity had telekinetic powers, that time travel was invented, and that in the future some sort of technology will be invented where no one can kill each other because the police will be alerted immediately and arrest the person responsible, forcing criminals to use time travel to get around this. So far, you fail to explain how TK becomes a part of humanity, your time travel is severely flawed, and now a major part of the story and the main thing driving older Joe is that someone in the future gets killed by the crime syndicate. Three major parts of the world building for this story and you've taken them out back and executed them only 45 minutes into the film. Like, yeah, it's not physically impossible for this to happen, but it's just so contrived. Why do hardened professional hitmen not have any measure of safe gun handling? He shoots her immediately, as he points the gun. Why would you have your finger on the trigger? Why do you even have a gun? You can't use it, so what's the point? I'll tell you what the point is. Ryan needed older Joe's wife to die to motivate him to fight back and get the plot going. And the only way for that to happen in front of old Joe that would make sense was for her to die quickly from an accidental gunshot. So that's what Ryan wrote. 
Joe explains that in the future all of the crime syndicates get taken over by someone known as the Rainmaker, and once he is in control the first thing he did was round up all the loopers who were still alive and started to close loops, which is what an older Seth mentioned earlier. He was the one who went after old Joe and got his wife killed, and so he believes that if he kills the Rainmaker when he's a child, he won't be able to take over the syndicates and the loops won't be closed, sparing him and his wife. The two get into a confrontation, with young Joe wanting to kill his older self and spare his life, and during the struggle he manages to tear off one of the coordinates which might lead to the Rainmaker's childhood home, and both Joes flee from the Gap Men, led by Kid Blue, with young Joe arriving at the farmhouse that the Rainmaker supposedly comes from. Joe chooses to hide around the farmhouse and wait to see if old Joe shows up. When a potential threat approaches the house and the woman loses her footing, Joe reveals himself, only for it to be a false alarm. Now, I think this is a pretty fucking stupid scene, because in all the ways that there could have been tension for the audience and a false alarm for the characters, Ryan literally just injected a random deaf mute guy into this random field in the middle of nowhere to ask for food. Off all the places to beg for food, why would this guy be here? The whole point of begging is to ask as many people as possible for food and money so that the scraps that they get given mean something, hence why a lot of homelessness is seen in the cities but not in small towns and villages. Here there's literally only this one place for miles around and if they don't give you anything you're fucked. He's literally just here because a scare was needed. It's lazy and it makes absolutely no sense in any way. We are introduced to Sarah and Sid, the two residents of the farmhouse, and Sarah agrees to let Joe stay in the barn while he goes through the withdrawals from his drug addiction. This is complicated when Joe tries to explain things to her, showing her house marked and Sid's hospital number, causing her to shoot him with rock salts. As he tries to explain things, we get this scene. It's gonna be used by these big criminal syndicates. You're a looper. Now, you're probably wondering, how does Sarah know what a looper is? And that's a very good question. It's just a shame that the movie really doesn't bother to answer it. She says at one point that she used to party in the city a lot, and it's possible that she might have met one, but the film never bothers to explain how Sarah knows. She just does because otherwise she wouldn't believe Joe and then the rest of the plot wouldn't happen. Sarah agrees to let Joe stay on the farmhouse to stop the man who was trying to kill Sid, as long as Joe agrees not to talk to Sid. Meanwhile, as his past is now changing, we see old Joe get the memories of the farmhouse, as well as struggling to remember his past and his wife. With the location of two of the three kids that might become the Rainmaker, he goes to the house of the first child, and although he is able to shoot him, killing the child causes Joe to break down crying over his actions, especially as it doesn't change his past and he realises he killed an innocent child. In the night, as old Joe is chased by the Gap Men, young Joe has a talk with Sid, where Sid asks questions about his job and explains that Sarah isn't his mother. In the morning, Joe questions Sarah about what Sid said, where she reveals that she is his mother, but she chose to live in the city and party so he was raised by her sister, who Sid believes is his mother, before telling Joe to stay away. As Sarah and Sid have an argument, Sid becomes extremely aggressive and she hides away in a safe, showing that he has telekinetic powers that can harm her. Later, after he calmed down and they comfort each other, Sarah is approached by one of the Gap Men, who try and search the house to find Joe, but are unable to find him thanks to the tunnel that Sid hides him in. Later that night, Sarah and Joe have sex, and Sarah explains that she feels immense guilt over abandoning Sid and her sister's death, so she will do anything to make sure he grows up okay. In the morning, we discover that the Gap Man has returned and taken Sarah hostage, and demands that Joe come with him. As they prepare to leave, the Gap Man realises someone is on the stairs and raises his gun frightening Sid and causing him to fall down the stairs. Sarah immediately tries to get Joe out the house as Sid has a breakdown, showing massive telekinetic powers and exploding the Gap Man. As Sid runs away, Joe contemplates killing him, seeing how destructive he can be, but he is unable to kill him when he sees that he's just a scared little boy. He advises Sarah to take Sid and run as the Gap Men and old Joe will be coming to the farmhouse. At the same time, old Joe is attempting to kill the second child on the list, but as he prepares to do it, his memories change, revealing to him that Sid is the Rainmaker. But before he can do anything, Kid Blue tases him, knocking him out and bringing him to see Abe, who has rallied all of the Gap Men so they can hunt young Joe down. Realising that he can kill all the Gap Men here, old Joe begins to take out the Gap Men, and it's so fucking contrived. So, for a start, you're telling me that pretty much all of the Gap Men are here in this building. Literally the only one we see show up after this is Kid Blue. We see no indication that there's any Gap Men left besides him. How convenient that all of the Gap Men are here in this building right when old Joe shows up so he can take them all out. And secondly, as you might already know from some other scenes he's directed, Ryan Johnson cannot direct fight scenes, and this scene is no exception. 
so Joe quickly backs Blue up into the wall, shooting his gun into his leg to incapacitate him, and then he unholsters it to kill the old man who is about to shoot him. This is fine. Joe worked very quickly here so the old guy being caught off guard makes sense. What doesn't make sense is why half a dozen guys standing around in the hallway have done absolutely nothing despite hearing gunshots right next to them. Some of them don't even have their pistols unholstered until Joe is in their sight and starts to fire on them. Now Joe proceeds to pick up what looks like two P90s and starts making his way towards Abe. And I cannot explain to you just how dumb this looks. The entire scene consists of the Gap men just running around, guns by their side, just walking into Joe's shots. He is coming to you. You have cameras that tell you where he is. Why are you lightly jogging towards his direction with your guns not even ready and then expecting to not get shot? Then there's this scene of the group of them just waiting for Joe to come around the corner, and they're all just huddled together like a bunch of fucking penguins. You have this entire room where you can spread out and take cover, but all of you choose to stand together in the middle of the room with nothing to protect yourselves. And then you just stand there when a belt full of grenades are lobbed at you and just sitting on the floor ready to blow up. This is not a fight scene. This is just a scene where people stand around not really doing anything waiting for Joe to kill them. And if Joe is killing all these people, surely this would dramatically mess up the future. Like if these members grow up to have important roles of the syndicates, and there's the fact that Abe was the person keeping track of the loopers and the targets that get sent back, then isn't this entire system, and therefore the entire storyline, fucked? If these Gap Men and Loopers are dead, then who is going to keep killing the people getting sent into the past? And if Abe is the one keeping track of who the Loopers are, and now he is dead and Joe has destroyed their operation, then how can the Syndicate keep track of who worked for them? They shouldn't be able to, which means that they wouldn't know who were Loopers and who needed to be sent back in time 30 years from now. Which means they would never be able to find Joe to send him back because they wouldn't know who he is or if he worked for them. So shouldn't he just vanish? I mean he should, but of course he won't because then the story Ryan wanted to tell just wouldn't take place. Because why would he try and make a story that sticks to a consistent set of rules and world building? Ryan Johnson's very easy to understand time travel that doesn't really affect the main plot ladies and gentlemen. So Kid Blue wakes up and finds everyone dead, with the farmhouse listed on the map. Young Joe meets his older self on the road, who asks him to just take the money and go live his life, but his younger self refuses to let Sid die. As he is about to kill his older self, Kid Blue comes around, distracting him. Lacking the range to kill Blue, Joe shoots the road to create a dust cloud, allowing him to get the drop on Blue and kill him. As Sarah and Sid try to get out, old Joe arrives and starts to shoot at them, and Sid, not understanding why Sarah is going towards Joe to run him over, stops the truck with his telekinesis, ruining the vehicle. As Joe tries to kill Sid, he grazes him across the jaw, angering Sid and causing another telekinetic outburst. Despite his anger, Sarah is able to calm him down, telling him that she is his mother and she loves him. Sarah tells him to flee into the fields while she stays to stop old Joe. And then the movie becomes incomprehensible. So young Joe comes to the realisation that the reason the Rainmaker exists is because his older self will kill Sarah, and so Sid will grow up to be angry and alone, becoming the Rainmaker and killing off the Loopers, as well as plenty of other people. And so, in order to stop him from doing this, Joe kills himself, erasing old Joe and saving Sarah's life in the process, stopping Sid from growing up to become a monster. Are you fucking stupid Ryan? Firstly, no. Young Joe cannot shoot old Joe from this distance with the blunderbuss. But the first thing that comes to his head is to just kill himself. If he shot himself through the arms with the blunderbuss and causes his older self to have permanent nerve damage or even amputated limbs, wouldn't that be just as effective? I mean I guess it doesn't really matter too much because the amount of time travel paradox shit these actions create for the movie is astounding either way. But the fact that you have someone who has been looking after his own self interest throughout the entire film choose to immediately kill himself instead of find another way comes across as extremely odd. Two days ago he sought out his closest friend for his own self interest. I don't see him being a hero figure to a kid he's talked to for a few hours. On top of that, why did he just not take Kid Blue's gun? You know, the one that can fire at long range? Was it to keep the plot going? Secondly, the whole point of old Joe's life is that he has no idea who the Rainmaker is or what happened to create him. If the Rainmaker existed in his life, then that would mean that these events, or a similar variation of them, occurred meaning that Joe should already know who this is and what he would need to do to stop him. But none of this happened in his life. He killed his old self and fucked off, so this literally doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The whole driving point of old Joe is that his wife died, because his loop was being closed, because the Rainmaker wanted him dead. The same Rainmaker that wouldn't exist because none of the shit that has happened in this movie happened in old Joe's life. Thirdly, okay, so this sequence has happened once before in the exact same way. 
So why didn't Joe kill himself then? If the story has done exactly the same thing that we've seen in the movie, then why wouldn't a previous version of young Joe come to the exact same conclusion and break the cycle? Oh, that's right, because then the movie couldn't happen. Fourthly, again, apparently this has happened before, and this caused Sid to learn about loopers and decide to close their loops and get them all killed when he grows up. Why? Instead of sending loopers back into the past to get killed, why wouldn't he just stop closing loops? Let the loopers live out their lives, so they don't get sent back into the past in the first place and they can't kill his mother. In fact, he doesn't even need to let them all live. He can just look at their profiles, see that old Joe is clearly the guy that killed his mother, and then leave him alone. The criminals would leave him alone and he wouldn't lose his wife, so then he wouldn't end up killing Sarah and Sid gets his mother back. But no, apparently Sid decided to send the loopers back into the past deliberately getting his mother killed and starting the whole chain of events. Chain of events that he has lived through and should know about. And fifthly, and it's the same problem that we keep seeing throughout the movie, the grandfather paradox. If Joe kills himself, his future self never gets sent into the past, so he never kills himself, so his older self exists, so he kills himself, yada yada yada. Many people struggle to understand how Ryan Johnson could make such a terrible Star Wars script, including myself. But now that I've re-watched this film, it makes complete sense how he could do that. This is a script that he worked on for years, where he was in control of all the rules and world building going on in the story. And he still completely fucked things up and disregarded them whenever they became annoying to the story he wanted to tell. Of course he's going to fuck up a movie in an already established franchise with a first draft script he wrote in a year. You have events in timelines where if one event happened, the other event cannot happen, because it would completely contradict the rules of cause and effect. Only for the final two minutes of the movie to say that these completely contradictory events actually did happen in the same timeline, despite the fact that if you use your brain you know they literally can't. You have some events that should be absolutely catastrophic to the timeline being casually brushed aside to keep the plot going. You have plot points that are just casually inserted into the film and then never elaborated on. You have information given directly to the audience only to contradict that information because otherwise the story wouldn't happen. And after going through the film and re-watching it over and over and seeing what the premise is, you know what the worst thing about this movie is? All of it makes absolutely no sense and is completely pointless. Putting time travel paradoxes and contradictory information aside, why are loopers even needed? You want someone dead in the future, but the forensics are so effective that no one can get away with murder without leaving something. Ignoring the fact that there's plenty of ways to kill someone without leaving any evidence, you have a time machine that not only sends people back in time, but you can send them to a completely different location than where the time machine is located. Why not just take the person you want dead, stick them in the time machine, and teleport them into the middle of the desert, or Antarctica, or the fucking ocean? So many options that don't involve the headache of management and employees and closing loops, yet for some reason sending someone into the past with a bunch of silver bars attached to them makes more sense than putting them tied up in the ocean to drown and be shark chum. Also, I know I've only really been talking about the script and the story elements in this video, but let me tell you that the audio mixing for this film is fucking garbage. I had to watch this movie through Premiere Pro because things like the music and the sound effects like gunshots were perfectly normal, but unless a character was shouting I couldn't hear a thing. Even with my laptop top volume at max level. It's like everyone was playing Chinese whispers throughout the entire film. So I raise the audio so I can actually hear what's going on, but then I can't get too comfortable because when an action scene kicks in or someone starts shouting, the audio starts to burst my eardrums. I've got no idea how they listened to this movie and thought, yep, those audio levels are perfectly normal. So there you have it everyone, the Ryan Johnson time travel movie where the time travel is simple and doesn't complicate the movie too much. Except once again he doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. If you just turn your brain off and watch the movie I'm sure you'll enjoy it. The acting is decent and there's a lot of good prop and set design. But the second you take time to actually think about anything that goes on screen you quickly realise that the entire film is absolute dog shit. Thanks for watching lads and lasses, I would like to give a big thank you to Robert Schroeder for being my first Patreon and helping to support the channel. If you enjoyed my videos please consider liking, subscribing and checking out some of my other videos. Sharing always helps and if you're feeling really generous please consider checking out my Patreon or YouTube membership. But overall I just hope you had a great day and hopefully I will see you in the next video.